Well, good evening and welcome to the Lessons of Vietnam show. Uh, glad you joined us tonight. Um, we're going to do a show tonight that um, I started out working on one show and, and it just kind of went off another show. Uh, so I got to be interesting. So I decided to go ahead and make it, make it part of the show instead of uh, and doing the show that I originally planned on. We're going to be talking a little bit tonight about the uh, names on the wall. But before we start that, let's do our commercial and tell you all about our show. Uh, we're trying to tell the story of the Vietnam War and the men and women who uh, served in the United States military, trying to dispel some of the myths and half-truths out there. It's amazing that how many of them still live. I am your host, Bill Dixon. I was in Vietnam in 67, 68, 159 Engineer Group, headquarters, headquarters company at Long Bend, uh, there for Tet. And we are broadcasting courtesy of Nissan Communications. They do all the uh, button pushing and, and sound and so forth so you can see it. Uh, they do a lot of shows that you uh, are to uh, tune into. For comments and suggestions, or, or to be, if you'd like to be a guest, uh, talk about anything about uh, Vietnam, whether you went or not, uh, contact me at um, dixonbill80 at yahoo.com. And if you'd like to participate in the live show, uh, go into uh, your phone and go 919-518-9773. Repeat that, 919-518-9773. Or even better, go into Computers 2K Voice. That is Computers 2K Voice you see there. And as always, if you are a veteran or you know a veteran, a family member, and you feel like you're in crisis with a lot of uh, people have been kind of locked up on their own doing this COVID thing. It's been a lot of stress out there. Uh, call the uh, crisis line you see there, the 1-800-273-8255 and press one. If you do not press one, you get a national crisis line, but if you're a press one, you will get a, uh, a veteran on the line. Uh, I talked to someone this weekend about the, how frustrated you already are. I didn't have to press one, but they tell me the number is changing, so you don't have to press one. So moving along to the show, uh, I'm going to recommend if you've got a pencil and paper, have it close by, because I'm going to give you some dates, and I want you to be able to compare a little bit. Uh, it's hard to keep up with who does what and when without it, but uh, if you don't, that's okay too. But it's uh, uh, can be very hard to keep up. All right, let's get started with the shows. We've got a lot of stuff. The stories that are names etched, in, uh, etched into the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. Each of the names etched into the face of the Black Grant Memorial represents a, pers a person who had a story that ended too soon. And I got to thinking about, well, their story really hasn't ended unless we forget them. We're going to look at their story. As long as we remember them, their story will continue. Just when the second Indochina War began, the American War has numerous dates. The Vietnam War is misunderstood, misreported, confused, lied about, uh, and most lied about war Americans ever been involved with. For most Americans, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, 4th of August, 1964, was the beginning of the Vietnam War. The Vietnam Memorial has etched in in 1959 as the beginning, even though they have names from 1957. The original idea of the wall was to look, start at 59, but there are names there on 57. Now, we're going to talk about the first soldier, American soldier killed in Vietnam. September 26, 1945, the first American soldier killed in the American phase of Vietnam War Dewey was the head of a seven-man team sent to Vietnam to search for missing American pilots and to gather information on the situation in the country after the surrender of the Japanese. Uh, because after the surrender there, Ho Chi Minh uh, and the Viet Minh uh, claimed that they were the government of Vietnam, even though the um, Potsdam uh, 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 Conference and a couple of others uh, had said there was no. Uh, September 26, 1945, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Dewey served in the Office of Strategic Services is shot and killed by the Viet Minh. Dewey is officially the first American killed in Vietnam War. Now, 
you're going to hear uh, the first, you're going to hear the first official several times. At the end of World War II, at the Potsdam Conference, the Allied forces met and decided what was to happen to Vietnam after the Japanese surrendered. Ho Chi Minh declared Vietnam's independence from France on September 2nd, 1945, just hours after Japan's surrender in World War II. When the French rejected his plan, the Viet Minh resorted to guerrilla warfare to fight for an independent Vietnam. There's the three leaders. You can see Churchill, uh, Roosevelt, and Stalin. Those were the big three. Uh, the British government, by way of the Potsdam Conference, was assigned to disarm and the surrendered uh, Japanese and stabilized Vietnam south of the 16th parallel. With the Viet Minh claiming control of the northern part of Vietnam and the French who wanted to step back into Vietnam, their former colony, were not very happy with the Viet Minh claiming the power. This angered the French colonel, uh, colonial officials and the remaining French soldiers who had been disarmed and, and disarmed and imprisoned by the Japanese. Now, if you see in the picture there, uh, that is an American team. It was called the Deer Team. It was sent in uh, early on to teach the uh, Viet Minh. Uh, you see Ho Chi Minh there with the shorts and the beard, and the guy with the hat was General Jip, uh, who was not a general at the time. But we sent the Americans in and going in to get them to help us look for uh, down American pilots, we kind of alluded to the fact that we might let you, you know, we might back you as far as having uh, your own government. So as a result of America's training in, in arming the Viet Minh, the new communist nationalist government looked favorably at the Americans at the time. Jury appeared to support the Viet Minh. He was invited by, to the Viet Minh to dinners and so forth. Well, the French commander, British Major General Douglas D. Gracie, he didn't like that idea. And he thought that the Viet Minh was getting a lot of grief. Uh, he was getting a lot of uh, grief from friend, uh, former French colonial officers. And he had Lieutenant uh, Dewey, Lieutenant Colonel, excuse me, uh, expelled from Vietnam. He told him he had to get out because he was uh, messing up his thing with the Viet Minh. Now, he was driving, uh, Dewey was driving a Jeep on his way to the airport, accompanied by another OSS officer, Captain Henny Bushel. Dewey refused to stop at a roadblock manned by three Viet Minh soldiers. He yelled back at them in French, and they opened fire, killing Dewey instantly. Bushel was, was unhurt and escaped on foot. It was later determined that the Viet Minh had fired on Dewey, thinking he was French. Speaking French, riding in a French uh, Jeep, that would probably do it. The second first, okay, we already got the first first. Now let's talk about the first, the second first, which is actually two people. Major Dale Ruiz and Master Sergeant Chester Avnan became the first Americans killed in the opening stage of the Vietnam War when Viet Cong guerrillas attacked a military assistance advisor group compound in Benoit, 20 miles north of Saigon. Now, I was right next to Ben Wyatt, Long Ben. Uh, and that's where the air base was later. Uh, Viet Cong attacked the mess hall where Ruiz and Othman were watching the movie Tattered Dress. I was not saying I might have to go back and look that one up. Uh, Master Sergeant Othman switched on the lights to change to the next reel. When VC Gorilla poked their weapons through the windows and sprayed the room with automatic weapon fire. Master Sergeant Othman was hit with several nine millimeter rounds. He immediately switched the lights off and headed to the top of the stairs where he was able to turn on the exterior floodlights. He died from his wounds right there on the stairs. Major Bush at that time was crawling towards the kitchen doors. When the exterior floodlights came on, he must have seen an attacker coming through the kitchen door. He got up and rushed towards the attacker but was only able to cover 15 feet before he was fatally hit from behind. His action startled the attacker who was about to throw his satchel charge through the door. The attacker's satchel charge had already been activated and his movement, his moment of hesitation caused him to blow himself up. This is uh, De uh, Major De uh, Dale Richard Bush Major. Uh, he was at uh, advanced team Benoit, 
uh, Army of the United States. He was born in 20, uh, 1921. He's on the wall panel, one East Line One, which is the first name on the wall. Uh, he started his tour in 7 6, 1959, and incident date was 7 8, 1959. So both of them, 59, he had only been in Vietnam two days. So, and he has a CIB there. Okay. Master Sergeant Chester Melvin Avnan, also known with surname Avnard, was born September 8, 1914, uh, killed July 8, 1959. Army records conflict as to what his actual name was. Charles Melvin Avnard or Chester Melvin Avnard, though that the latter appears on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial it is possibly an indication of general consensus among the memorial planners. In other words, nobody knew. Chester, Chester Melvin Avnard died 9 July 59. His name is the second on the wall, panel 1 East, line 1. It was later discovered that his last name was misspelled and wrong initial. Chester N. Avnard. To correct the error, his name was re-engraved on panel 7E, line 46, where it was discovered his middle initial was again wrong. Just to A of then, there has been no indication that his name with all the correct information will be re-engraved again. In other words, he was on, he's on the first panel, but he's also on panel 7E. So we got the same man, two different places. Okay, that was his picture. Uh, he was from Copper's Cove, Texas. That's where I was when I came back from Vietnam. That's him in uh, the Civil Star. So now we have two first, but they're not quite certain who the two, who, what their names were. One, oh, no, Sergeant. Now let's talk about another first. We, now we've basically got three first, or is it the fourth first? Technical Sergeant Richard Bernard Fitzgibbon, Fitzgibbon Jr., United States Air Force, born 1920, June 8, 1956. Okay. That would put him before uh, Bruce and Avnut. Okay. Was the first American to lose his life in the conflict that would later be known as the Vietnam War. But a while ago, they said Dewey was the first guy to lose his life. But anyway, he was murdered by another American airman and died of his wounds later on June 8, 1956. Through the Ephesus sister, Alice Fitzgibbon, and Rose Adele Rossi, a former Stoneham, Massachusetts select woman, Fitzgibbon's name was added to the Vietnam War Memorial, Vietnam War Memorial on Memorial Day, May 1999. That's his picture. He is on the panel 52 East. Line 21, because the wall was already there, and when they added his name, they had to add it the first place they could find to put it. So even though he was now the first, first, that they had to put it in where they could. Okay. Follow, but here's a little follow-up on that. Follow his father's footstep, Richard B. Fitzgibbons, Fitzgibbon, third joined the United States Marine Corps and also later served in Vietnam, where he too was killed in September 1965. The Fitzgibbon deaths are one of only three amongst all U.S. casualties in which both father and son were killed in the Vietnam War. And that's him. He was Lance Corporal. He is on uh, panel 2 East, line 77. That puts him on the wall before his father. Uh, September 7th, 1965 is his casualty date. Now, let's talk about the fourth or the fifth first. Specialist four, James Thomas Davis, was not actually the first American to lose his life in combat in Vietnam, but apparently President Lyndon Johnson in a speech referred to Specialist four, James T. Davis, as the first American. And now several websites uh, refer to Davis this way. Uh, you, that's him down there. He was, um, you see the pic pictures of the Germans riding around with the little cars and the thing up on top where they were getting um, 
radio signals fixed. That's what he was doing there when he was. Uh, Davis, one of the first and two weeks after his death, in tribute to Davis's service and sacrifice, his unit's headquarters at Tonsonute Air Base there at, at uh, Saigon would be named Davis Station. 15 servicemen, six Air Force, five Army, and four Navy had been killed or listed as missing in action by the time the Specialist 4 Davis team was wiped out. And nine others had died of illness or non-hostile injury. So he was definitely not the first, but in uh, Johnson's speech, he mentioned the first, and a lot of people today still think that Davis is the first. Davis unit had a difficult and dangerous job. The third radio research unit provided technical advice to South Vietnamese units on locating enemy signals and providing valuable training and guidance on its way to get it fixed on the insurgent's location. In other words, if they had a radio they were using, we'd get the fix on them and know where they were. But in Indochina, climate and terrain made the uh, art of direction finding extremely tricky. Due to the mountainous landscape and the high levels of humidity in the area, or well, that's an understatement, it was difficult for them to conduct their uh, work in a safe and secure location far from the battlefront. Davis and the units he worked with had to get in close to be successful. On 22nd December 1961, Davis received orders to lead a Vietnamese team to an area approximately 12 miles from the base in an effort to locate a Viet Cong guerrilla force operating the area. They would move by truck to the area set up and in, in concert, with, concert with a similar team in another location to attempt to locate the enemy. Initially, the operation appeared to be routine. However, 10 miles outside the base near a former French garrison, the hunter, uh, the hunter became the hunted. The truck carrying the team hit a strategically placed landmine and was forced off the road. The group immediately came under attack. Davis and his men fought bravely but eventually succumbed to enemy fire. A patrolling South Vietnamese Civil Guard unit quickly responded to the area, but it was too late. Davis and nine members of his team lay dead. This was back before the helicopters got uh, so predominant there. Uh, that's Davis. Uh, he was uh, on radio research, uh, which was basically to listen, listen to the uh, signals of, of the enemy and uh, use that information. He's on the wall 1E. Okay, 1E uh, line four. Okay. Now, let's talk about another first. What is, how many is that now? Five, six, okay. Captain Harry Griffin Kramer Jr. Born May 24th, 1926 in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. He died October 21st, 1957. That puts him right in there with Fitzgibbons. Near Nha Trang, uh, South Vietnam, was an American soldier who served in Korea and Vietnam. He was the first U.S. Army soldier to be killed in the Vietnam War. I guess the, the answer to that is Army soldier. Fitzgibbons was uh, Air Force. Maybe that's how we get to another first. A street at Fort Lewis, Washington is named in his honor. He is buried at the United States Military Academy in West Point, New York. Kramer was, was recognized the first casualty in Vietnam when his name was added to the Vietnam Memorial in 1983. Previously, it had been declared as spec for James T. Davis, who died along with nine South Vietnamese soldiers in a Viet Cong ambush on 22nd December 1961. Some historians now consider the first casualty to be murder, murder Air Force Technical Sergeant Richard B. Fitzgibbon. Fitzgibbon, who was shot after a dispute with a drunken fellow airman and died of his wounds on June 8, 1956. Kramer was 57. Kramer is still considered the first U.S. Army casualty in Vietnam, as well as the first casualty of the newly formed 1st Special Forces Group to honor him, the men of the 1st uh, Special Forces Group wore black armed bands for 30 days after his death. At Parachute Drop Zone in Okinawa, Kramer Drop Zone was named in his honor. Later, when the, 20, uh, the first Special Forces Group moved into his new facilities at Fort Lewis in 1987, they named his street, Kramer Avenue, after him. That's uh, 
In, in June to November 1957, Kramer and his unit began training Vietnamese Special Forces in raiding operations and related skills. The realistic exercises involved a small-scale ambush and raids. The Arvin, which is the, um, the, the soldiers of the South Vietnam Army, 5th Light Division in the field near the train was used as the opposing force. The class was undergoing a series of field training exercises before their graduation in late October when Kramer was involved in a training accident on October 21st, 1957. During an ambush drill, a Vietnamese soldier near Kramer was ready to throw a lit block of melanite, a French military high explosive. When it prematurely uh, detonated, the melanite was later determined to have deteriorated in storage and was unstable. It's been something like um, uh, nitro. Kramer died instantly, and other members of the team and their students were wounded. Kramer's name was added to the wall in November 1983. This was after successful efforts by Captain Kramer's son, Lieutenant Colonel Harry G. Kramer III, United States uh, Army, then an active duty Army officer to get the Department of Defense to acknowledge his father's death. Captain Kramer's son asked that his father's name simply be added to the center one each stone out of sequence, but it's still clearly listed in the chronological book at the wall as 1957, not 1959. Remember, the wall starts in 1959. In October 2007, the Army conducted an official ceremony at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, from which Captain Kramer had graduated to mark the fifth anniversary of the first Vietnam casualty. That is uh, Kramer, uh, Captain Kramer there, uh, mobile, mobile, mobile training team, 14th Special Forces Ops, first group. Okay. There, is the, there is the beginning of the wall, 1959. You see uh, Dale R. Lewis, no, no ranks are put there. Uh, and Chester Othnard, and remember, he's again listed on panel seven down. The wall, if you didn't haven't been there, it starts in the middle and ends in the middle. It starts in 1959, and the panel to the left of it is the end of the wall, and that's 1975. But you can see some of the first names there. Uh, can't see Kramer's name on there, but anyway, it was it's put on there someplace, okay? Now, this is panel, uh, this is the uh, where it ends right here, 1975. Uh, I recognize several names uh, there on the bottom right there, uh, but we're going to talk about uh, Richard Vandegeer in a minute. But uh, two names we're going to be doing a show on is uh, Gary Hall, Joseph Hargrove, and Danny Marshall. We're going to do another show on this. More names are added to the wall every year. The ceremony is held on Mother's Day, and the additional uh, additions might be as simple as rectifying a clerical error as as heartbreaking as a veteran dying. All these years later, from uh, from a wound suffered during the war. There's a strict criteria, but if you were wounded and you were suffering from those wounds all those years, and you die, uh, your name can be put on the wall if the family asks. Air Force Second Lieutenant Richard Vandegeer is the last name on the wall, a pilot who died after his helicopter crash on May 15, 1975, during the war's, war's final combat action. This was after the fall of Saigon. Uh, the fall of Saigon is coming up, 29th and 30th of, of this month. Vandegeer was on a mission to rescue the crew of the SS Mayaquez. A merchant ship captured three days early off the coast of Cambodia by the Khmer Rouge. The ship had been taken to the Isles of Koh Tang. Vandegeer's CH-53 helicopter was met by a wall of anti-aircraft fire and was shot down and crashed in the water with 26 men aboard. Though 13 were rescued at sea, the rest died, either upon impact or soon after. 20 years passed before Vandegeer's remains were identified and another five passed before his funeral at Arlington National Cemetery. Vandegeer had spent his last weeks at war evacuating Americans as Saigon fell. 
he was one of those helicopters going in to the building, to the embassy and the building next to the embassy that everybody thinks was the embassy in the picture. By his own estimate, he had helped pull out close to 2,000 people. And then a couple of weeks later, he is uh, uh, killed coming in to uh, rescue uh, 31, 31 sailors. Richard Vandegeer's second lieutenant, uh, that's him. He's on panel one west line 132, which is basically the last name on the wall. That's it. At only 15, he was the youngest U.S. Marine killed in action in the Vietnam War. Private First Class Dan Bullock, a young teenager who, who as a Marine, ultimately sacrificing his life as he served his country, having lived 15 years, five months, and 17 days. That's a picture of Danny. Bullock was born in Goldsboro, North Carolina on December 21st, 1953. Following his mother's death, 12-year-old Dan and his sisters left for Brooklyn, New York, in order to stay with his father and stepmother. Fourteen years old at the time, with a height of five five foot nine inches and a height of a weight of one hundred and sixty pounds, Bullock decided to join the military. The minimum age for enlistment was seventeen years old, and even at that age, a signed parental parental consent to be enlisted was required. But Bullock was completely undeterred by this restriction. He managed to alter his birth certificate, showing his birth date as December twenty first. 1949. The recruitment staff at Albee Square Marine Recruiting Station was none the wiser, and I'm certain they wouldn't have asked anyway. Believing he was 19 years old, they enlisted Bullock successfully with the U.S. Marine Corps, and when he was assigned to boot camp at Paris Island, South Carolina. Oh, yes. Bullock, being so young, struggled through months of training at the boot camp. Uh, sounds like he got... Um, uh, if you don't pass the uh, first boot camp, you're kind of you're put back to another platoon and start all over again. Uh, Bullock managed to graduate with the help of Franklin MacArthur, a fellow recruit who befriended him. According to MacArthur, he had decided to help the 14-year-old. But M MacArthur did not know Dan's age; he just knew he was uh, um, was having trouble. He didn't find out until after after the death when everybody else found out. Through the rigorous boot camp training, because he understood uh, what put a rifle in the boy's hand, the desire to help his family. Bullock's father earned a living as a lumber worker and as a sharecropper, and Bullock wanted to help. But he had no skills to land a job in New York. Bullock arrived in South Vietnam, over 8,500 miles away from home, on May 18, 1969. One can only imagine what was running through his young mind as he stepped into the atmosphere of South Vietnam, where the sounds and smells of war seemed to have become constant. But Bullock kept to himself because he was afraid that his secret would get out. He didn't quite fit in with the rest of the group because he didn't really talk a whole lot. Uh, now age 15, in a private first class, he was assigned to 2nd Squad, 2nd Platoon, Fox Company, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, 1st Marine Division, where he served as rifleman. You can see there uh, the two guys standing at Anwa Combat Base. A bullet was stationed at Anwa uh, Combat Base a few kilometers west of Hoi An. Uh, Hoi An was, uh, if you go to Vietnam, it's a great place to go. That's one of the older cities in Vietnam, in Quang Nam Province. At 1 a.m. on June 7, 1969, the base came under attack by the North Vietnamese Army, the NVA. Now, this is not the Viet Cong. This is the guys right, that, with the weapons and training and uniforms, uh, just like the Americans. Hostilities grew through the night, and casualties rose on both sides. Bullock played his, his own role in the fight. As the attack pressed on, it would soon be clear that the Marines were outnumbered. Bullock promptly began ru making runs to deliver extra ammunition to his beliefs. Comrades who were desperately trying to hold off the assault. Unfortunately, Bullock was on his second supply run when he was hit by several rounds from small firearms and died instantly. It wasn't until reporters went to Bullock's family that everyone came to know that Bullock was only 15 years old. What made a young African American such as Dan Bullock make that decision to go to war? 
His sister Gloria said, Dan wanted to get an education to make something of himself and saw the Marines as a way to get there. He had plans to continue his education upon returning from Vietnam. In honor of Dan's bravery in June 2003, the New York City Council renamed a section of Lee Avenue in Brooklyn, where Bullock had lived when he was 11 years old, in his honor. Bullock is not the only one who was underage. At least five were 16 years old, and at least 12 were 17 years old. Three other Marines were also killed during the attack that Dan was killed in. Bullock's body was returned to North Carolina and buried in Elmwood Cemetery in Goldsboro without a headstone. 31 years later in 2000, television talk show Sally Jesse Raphael, upon learning the story of his involvement in South Vietnam and his age, donated a headstone. Shortly after it was as a memorial service for Bullock in Goldsboro, in 2017, the highway mark was installed in Goldsboro on, in his honor, commemorating his service to the United States. And there are uh, Vietnam veterans now in Goldsboro who keep the um, site clean and, and picked up and, and so forth. There's your uh, marker. Dan Bullock, private first class, New York. It's listed as New York because that was the site where he um, uh, enlisted from, even though he was basically from Goldsboro. December 21st, 1953 to June 7th, 1969. He is on West Panel 23, Line 96. Now let's talk about this man. Sergeant Robert G. Davison of Muskegon, Michigan, joined the Marine Corps at the age of 14. He had four years of service in the Marines when he was shipped to Vietnam at age 18. Robert was killed in action on December 17, 1966, one day before his 19th birthday. He was an E-5 sergeant. He was a machine gunner. Uh, his cat, he started his tour uh, 11-30, 1966, and he was killed uh, just about a month later at 14. And that's his picture, but he was actually not, uh, 18 when he was killed. That's a uh, lot, lot later than um, uh, Dan was killed uh, and he, cause he served stateside for a while before his body was recovered. Hostile died, while, hostile died while missing, okay? That means casual date 12-17-1966, but it was identified 10-6-1971. In other words, they could not get his body and he was listed as missing for a while, but he was recovered and is now on the wall. The oldest serviceman, and here it gets tricky, the oldest U.S. serviceman to die in the Vietnam War was Clyde Taylor, age 62. He was born on uh, 30th of June, 1908. He died at 62 years old, 21 September, 1970. He was a United States Navy storekeeper who served with Supply Division Detachment in July, naval support activities in Da Nang. He died of a heart attack and was the oldest United States serviceman to die while in service in South Vietnam. He's on the wall in uh, panel W7, line 82. Uh, let's go down. He was a petty officer. Uh, let's see. Casual date was 9 21 He was in the service 22 years. The incident date and the casual dates are all the same. Uh, Non-hostile, died of other causes, ground casualty or inland waterway, and then it says heart attack. There's uh, 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 Kenna Clyde Taylor, his picture and so forth, okay. But Clyde Taylor is, now here's where it gets tricky. Kenna Clyde Taylor is the oldest man to die in Vietnam but he is not the oldest man whose name is etched into the Vietnam War wall. Now that can kind of confuse you there if you think about it. Let me tell you the story. The oldest person on the wall is Dwayne McGriff at 63 years old. Army Sergeant First Class McGriff 
experienced a traumatic event which ultimately resulted in loss of life on September 7, 1970. Recorded circumstances attributed to, to died of wounds or, effective, or effects of action, explosive device, incident location in South Vietnam, Tainan province. Now, he died in 1970. Sergeant First Class Dwayne U. McGriff was a construction equipment repair serving with the 984th Engineer Battalion on September 7, 1970. South Sergeant First Class McGriff was 34. He had just begun his second one-year tour of duty. That day, his unit was attacked by Moors and reportless rifle fire. McGriff was wounded in the attack and was evacuated to the 12th Evacuation Hospital in Kuchi. So it says he lost his life, but the, the incident was in 1970. He did not die there, but he was wounded. His left leg was so badly mangled that he actually lost it, eventually lost it, excuse me. He had to lie flat on his back for two years after coming back from the, to the States. His wife, Anna, recalled in an interview he had lost so much thigh tissue that he could not have a prosthesis. So he'd use crutches. His wife knew he was in agony. He would scrunch up his face, she said, but he would never tell you. He had dozens of operations, some to take skin from healthy parts of his body and attach it to the wound area. In 1974, he developed problems with his stomach so serious that a nylon mesh was installed to rebuild much of it. He was in and out of hospitals so often that doctors and nurses regarded him as a friend. He contracted hepatitis. He had liver and kidney problems. For his, the last six years of his life, he lay in bed. He died on January 7th, 1999 at the age of 63. He lived 28 years and four months after being wounded, his wife said. He was here for a reason. The years of pain were not without joys. She was quick to say. Her husband did some woodworking and lots of reading. Best of all, he got to watch his kids grow up. His children, Dwayne and Linda, were grade schoolers when the father was wounded. We were blessed the way the Lord worked it all out, Mr. McGriff said. His name is added to the Vietnam Memorial Wall in May 2003. That could be a great, an interesting uh, trivia question. Who's the oldest man on the wall? Who's the oldest man to die in Vietnam? The difference. Casual date, September 7th, 1970. Age at loss, 63. That's his picture. He was with the 20th Engineer Brigade. I wore that patch. Uh, instant date was 1970. He lived 20, right at 29 years or 28. At least one soldier was killed as a result of an attack by a tiger. There were more, but uh, not, a lot of them not recorded as being that way. It's recorded as uh, unknown. Uh, Marine uh, PFC Francis Baldino at about 2145 hours. Uh, that's almost midnight, a couple hours there. He was attacking, on, he was acting as patrol's RTO. In other words, he was a radio operator. He was three, three paces behind the patrol leader when he was attacked and carried off. His body was recovered the next day. Now, you're walking right behind uh, somebody, three paces, and all of a sudden, this tiger comes out and grabs you and pulls you off. Uh, I know the uh, lieutenant was three paces ahead of him wondered uh, about that. Francis Baldino, military data, United States Marine Corps. Uh, private first class. He started his tour 8 2 1968. He was uh, been there about three months. Uh, body recovered, casual type, non hostile. Died of other ca uh, uh, causes, uh, ground casualty, Un uh, other causes undefined. So if his story not had been gotten out that he was gotten by a tiger, nobody would ever know it before then. His body was found the next day, and that's his picture. Uh, October 11th, 1949 to November 14th, 1968. He's on West Panel, 
So if you're facing the wall, that would be the uh, panels to your right in DC uh, and line six to three. The last Marine helicopter lost in, in Vietnam. The last Marine helicopter lost in Vietnam was YT-14 from 164 on 42975. There is another last at 164 history, that of the two pilots, KIA, at 1130 p.m. on 42975. Captain Nystel and First Lieutenant Shea were the last Marines KIA in Vietnam. Last squadron, last CH-46 lost. Last Marine injured, last Marines killed in action. Okay. The CH-46 was lost at sea during the night of 29 the 30th of April, 1975, during Operation Frequent Wind, the evacuation of Saigon Embassy, the loss of uh, search and rescue air aircraft flying Angel from, for the U.S. Hancock, accounted for the final Marine casualty of the Vietnam era. Since that operation ended in the early hours of the morning of the 30th with the extraction of the American ambassador, so did all U.S. involvement with, within Vietnam end as the ambassador pulled out. What they were doing is they were pulling uh, the troops out. But this is not really the last Marine helicopter to pull out or to be shot down. This is one of the last, even though it's listed as the last here. But you remember a while ago, we had the last Marine helicopter was actually shot down uh, during the Mayaquez situation. But there they had uh, Army helicopters, they had Air Force helicopters and Marine helicopters. Late on the night of the 29th and well into the operation when the CH-46 search and rescue helicopter crashed into the South China Sea alongside the Hancock. It was tragic to say the least. Both the pilot, Captain Bill Nystel, and co-pilot, First Lieutenant Mike Shea were lost at sea. The other two enlisted crew were rescued. rescued. They had progressed to evening. The ambassador still refused to leave Saigon. It was dark and it was getting later. All crews were pushing their safe flight time limits. Twice in the final hours of their search and rescue flight, they were on final approach to the Hanscock when they were sent back out to the orbit point for uh, another possible mission. In other words, they were getting ready to come back in. It was sent back out and told to circle in case it was another mission. They were to report with were to, they were to report when they were down to 30 minutes fuel remaining. Fatigue pilots on the flight crew had been flying continuously for 10 hours, and the aircraft uh, air, air crew had been working continuously for 17 hours. The the helicopter had came in and they switched pilot and co-pilot, but not the crew. The final approach was waved off. In pitch black night, they flew into the water with no apparent awareness that was was happening. They did not make any distress call or respond to frantic calls from Rafa. That is what the helicopter looked like. The next evening, the Hancock held a traditional burial sea service without recovering the remains. The crash site was located in 65 feet of water, but because of the immensely political pressure to vacate the area, no attempts for rec recovery was made. This was the final acts of the uh, Vietnam War. Uh, as you saw uh, from uh, pictures and so forth, they were pushing helicopters and stuff off the uh, aircraft carriers to make room for the South Vietnamese airplanes and helicopters coming in, unloading, unloading people. This is the captain. He's on panel W1, line 124. William Craig Nostal, captain. That's his picture. Uh, January 4th, 1946 to April 29th, 1975. Body has not been recovered as of this date and probably never will. Michael John Shea, he was uh, the um, co-pilot, first lieutenant. Casual date was 4-29-1975. Offshore South Vietnam, body not recovered. Casual type Non-hostile, died of other causes. Air loss or crash at sea. There you see their, their funeral service was going on, uh, the funeral at sea. 
uh, even though there were no bodies, they did perform and give them a funeral there at sea. This is what the Michael John Shea looked like. Is uh, make sure we don't forget him. He's uh, like I said, wall uh, west one, line one twenty four. Now let's talk about this one. Charles McMahon or McMahon, May tenth, nineteen fifty three to April 29, nineteen seventy five, and Darwin Lee Judge, February sixteenth. 1956 to April 29th, 1975, were the last two United States servicemen killed in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. The two were, uh, it's, it's tricky, you gotta, you gotta see the semantics here. Uh, the, both of these men are Marines, but they are not the last Marines on the wall because they were not the last Marines killed, even though the last Marines killed in Vietnam. Okay. Let's see how that happened. The two men, both U.S. Marines, were killed in a rocket attack one day before the fall of Saigon. But McMahon and Judge were the last American ground casualties in Vietnam. They are not the last casualties of the Vietnam War, a term which also covers the U.S. involvement in Cambodia and Laos, recorded on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Those things belong to the 18 Americans killed in the uh, Marquez incident. Charles McMahon, 11 days short of his 22nd birthday, was a corporal from Woodburn, Woburn, Massachusetts. Darwin Judge was a 19-year-old Lance Corporal and Eagle Scout from Marshalltown, Iowa. McMahon and Judge were members of the Marine Security Guard Battalion of the U.S. Embassy Saigon and were providing security for the uh, DAO compound adjacent to Tonsonut Airport in Saigon, right outside of Saigon. McMahon had arrived in Saigon on 18th of April, while Judge had arrived in early March. Both died in a North Vietnamese rocket attack on Tonsonut um, during the fall of Saigon on the morning of 20, April 29th, 1975. They were the last two killed in country. In accordance with procedures for deceased Americans in Vietnam, their bodies were transferred to the Saigon Adventist Hospital near Tonsonut. In telephone calls to the hospital on the afternoon of April 29th, the few remaining staff, advi staff advised that the bodies had been evacuated. In fact, the bodies were left behind. Operation Frequent Wind, the American evacuation of Saigon, was completed the following day, April 30th, 1975. Senator Edward M. Kennedy of Massachusetts, through diplomatic channels, secured the return of the bodies the following year. Judge was buried with full military honors in March 1976 in Marshalltown, Iowa. It was a flag draped coffin, a Marine honor guard, and a rifle firing salute. The flag that covered his coffin was folded and presented to his parents. His funeral was so ignored. That, that major and minor media did not even attend the event. The last man to die. The lone exception was the Daily Iowan, Iowa City, Iowa. Due to ignorance of his military funeral in March 1976, Judge was given a second Marine barrel 25 years later through planning by Douglas Potrots, United States Marine Corps Master Sergeant, who served with Judge in Saigon and Ken Locke, boyhood friend and fellow Eagle Scout. Retired U.S. Marine um, Corps Lieutenant Colonel Jim Keene, the commanding officer of the Marines during the fall of Saigon, presented a flag to judge's parents at a ceremony held at the Iowa Veterans Home Vietnam War Memorial. That's his information. Uh, Marshalltown, let's see, remains 19, the uh, location. The casual date was 429, 1975. Remains status body not recovered, found later. He was, uh, his remains were sent back in 1976. He was actually identified a month later in uh, 1976. Hostile doubt outright, casually detailed artillery, rocket, or mortar. And that's his picture. Uh, West 1, line 124. Charles M. McHunt. 
on the wall panel, West one, uh, West one, uh, embassy, embassy, American Embassy Saigon E Company, United States Marine Corps Security Guard Battalion, uh, Benoit Providence. Again, he, his body was brought, was recovered uh, a year later. He was 21 years old. And that's his picture. Both of them are sharp looking Marines. At the, as the end of the Vietnam War approached, a mission called Operation Baby Lift began with the global go goal of ev evacuating over 2,000 orphans from Saigon. We call them Amerasians. Children born of American and Vietnamese uh, get together. The last woman to die in Vietnam, Captain Mary Klinker, was a flight nurse assigned to care of the orphans while they were being transported. On April 4th, 1975, the first transport flight of Operation Baby Lift took off from Tonsonoon Air Base outside of Saigon. Unfortunately, shortly after takeoff, the rear loading ramp locks of the C 58 Galaxy cargo transport plane malfunctioned, causing a series of mechanical failures. The pilots attempted an emergency landing as the plane slid across rice paddies. It broke apart, resulting in the deaths of 138 people, including Captain Blinker. As you can see, that's the, the baby is put on the airplane in, in boxes like that, and you can see the plane crash. In the crash, the 27-year-old Clinker from Lafayette, Indiana, became the last nurse and the only member of the, Air, of the Air Force Nurse Corps to be killed in Vietnam. She received the Airman's Medal and the Meritorious Service Medal. They went on and successfully uh, evacuated uh, several thousand of the Amerasians. Mary Clinker, she was, uh, let's see, she was captain. She was 27 years old, uh, non-hostile, died while missing. Fixed crew, air loss, or crash over land. Now, did, the body was recovered, okay? That's her picture. She is on uh, panel 1 West, line 122. That's a big panel. That's hers. Now, the last to die, Gary L. Hall, Joseph N. Hargrove, and Danny G. Marshall. 15, 1975, the Marquez incident, uh, May 1975, there's the Marquez ship. Uh, Marines recaptured the ship and the cost of 39 Marine lives. I have read, we just read there was 18, and I've also got information there was 41. So uh, like everything else, there was a lot of confusion there. Uh, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna do that. We're gonna talk about them a little bit later. There's uh, their pictures. Did have the names there. Let's, I know Joseph on the end, on the, on the end here. But that's the three men who were left on the island and nobody went back to get, which is a story to itself. We've done several shows on uh, on Joseph, but uh, we're going to do one of the whole my quests coming up. Okay. There are estimated 35 men were mistakenly listed on the wall at dedication that were still alive. Now, that's got to be interesting. Go find your name on the wall. Now, when you go, uh, these names are not listed in the directories. If you notice out, uh, outside the wall, there's books, thick books, and you go find out, look up the name, and it tells you a word of, on so forth. So uh, it's probably hard to find them. All right. Um, we'll go back to the slide I'm on. There you go. Largest uh, per capita loss, Billsville, Ohio, population 475, 475. Gained unwanted national attention between 1966 and 1971 by having suffered the largest per capita loss of life in the Vietnam War. With a population of 475, six young men lost their lives in the war, a terrible and profound loss for this small town. High state, of ca high state casualties. West Virginia had the highest casualty rate in the nation, according to the U.S. Department of Defense. The state had 711 casualties. Um, it must have been broken out. 39.9 deaths per 100,000 people. Okay, that's a, that coming up because North Carolina had over a thousand, uh, but it was by uh, population, 39.9 uh, per 100,000. Oklahoma had the second highest casualty rate. The highest high school casualties, Thomas Edison High School in Philadelphia sustained the largest number of Vietnam War casualties than any high school in the nation. 
54 students out of that high school were lost. And the Marines of um, Amorensi, I hope I pronounced that close, they led some of the scrappiest high school football and basketball teams that the little Arizona copper town of Marensi population 5,058 had ever known and cheered. They enjoyed roaring, roaring beer bust. In quieter moments, they rode horses around the uh, uh, Corona, Corona Trail, uh, stalked deer in the Ap uh, Apache National Forest, and in their patriotic camaraderie, typically of Monroe's mining families, the nine graduates of uh, Morgan High School enlisted as a group in the Marine Corps. The service began on Independence Day, 1966, and of the nine who enlisted, three returned home. Let's not forget those who gave everything for us. We've talked about a lot of first, uh, and a lot of first that were not first. And it's kind of how you ask the question. But the wall has got 58,000 plus names on it. And we just cannot forget those men because they had families. And you think about what would have come out of them had they had lived. Yes, they have quit having stories, but their story is still out there. And we need to remember their stories. Everybody on the wall had a story. Each one of those men we just talked about, young men, most of them, had a story about how they got there, where they were, and so forth. So our next show is, is the 28th of this month. That's just before uh, the. Uh, Recording of um, Like Christmas Starts Playing. That's the music that was played for at the end of the war so that the Americans would know they needed to report to places of demarcation because the war was coming to an end as far as the Americans were trying to rescue them. And how they let them know was they started playing uh, uh, White Christmas, and that was the uh, song to tell everybody to head for the embassy. Uh, hope you have a great great uh, weekend and i hope you're not suffering from the pollen we're supposed to get a little rain here today and i think i hope so because my car which was black is kind of a weird color now so you have a good night and please share our show with all your friends and thank you for tuning in good night tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.